Hi, everyone. I'm Anne Marie Slaughter. I'm the CEO of New America. I'm delighted to welcome you to our event today on reinventing the State Department. Uh, and before we get going, I'm going to hand uh, the virtual mic uh, to Mike Tomaski, the editor of Democracy Journal, uh, at, who uh, is co sponsoring this event with us. So, Mike, over to you. Thanks, Anne Marie. And hi, everyone. And thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, and uh, Anne Marie, thank you most of all for. Uh, hosting this and, and, and for writing this great piece. This, uh, I'll be very quick, but Anne-Marie and I were at a dinner in, I guess it was April of 2019. It certainly wasn't April of 2020. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, it was one of those Washington dinner discussions uh, about foreign policy, a, a couple dozen people. And Anne-Marie had the floor and was making some substantive point. I can't remember what it was, but she finished by saying, uh, but if we do that, then we have to talk about reorganizing the State Department, which hasn't been done since the 1920s. And I have a lot of thoughts on that topic. And as soon as she said that, uh, the light went off over my head. And I thought, that's a piece. Uh, and so finally, here we are. Uh, it's exactly the kind of piece that we love to do in Democracy Journal that looks uh, around the corner and, and uh, takes on serious questions that I think a lot of other publications just kind of don't look at. Um, I just want to add quickly a plug for uh, what we have up on our site currently, a special issue uh, called Trump versus Democracy, which has 35 pieces by various contributors. Um, speaking of the State Department, Hillary Clinton uh, has a piece in that package. Uh, I hope perhaps you'll check it out if you have a chance. But anyway, thanks, everyone. And I will pass it now to Candace, who will moderate the event. Thanks, Mike. Uh, thanks, Anne-Marie. Hi, everyone. I'm Candice Rondeau. I'm a senior fellow with the International Security Program here at New America and a professor with uh, Arizona State University. Really excited to be here today. This is kind of uh, a foreign policy geeks um, paradise here. We've got some great speakers and we have a great topic. Um, I, I want to just quickly introduce uh, our speakers uh, and um, just sort of set the scene a little bit and um, hopefully we can have a conversation and then we'll open it up for Q&A so everybody can um, chime in with your questions, your comments, and we'll be tracking that online uh, and hopefully we'll get a few of those in uh, toward the end of our conversation here. So uh, obviously for foreign policy geeks like me, uh, most of the folks here don't really need much of an introduction. Henry Slaughter, of course, the CEO of New America, but also um, most famously uh, the former Director of Policy Planning at State Department, which is basically, uh, you know, the brain trust, as it were, uh, of how to do diplomacy in America, um, and obviously, uh, formerly the Dean of uh, what is now uh, the School of Public and uh, International Affairs at Princeton University, and uh, President of the International Law Association. Many, many, many uh, achievements and accolades. It's probably too long to get into here. Um, but obviously, Anne-Marie has kicked off the discussion with her piece, um, and I think it's going to be a really robust discussion. Um, next, we have, of course, Congressman Ro Khanna, and he comes to us from the great golden state of California, uh, and where he represents the 17th district, uh, and has done since 2017. Um, Congressman Khanna is formerly the Secretary of Commerce under the Obama administration. He serves on three con congressional committees including House Armed Services Committee, uh, Budget Committee, and most importantly for this conversation, the Committee on Oversight and Reform, which is gonna be a really uh, big piece of whatever happens with the State Department now and in the future. Uh, Ambassador Nick Burns uh, is another person who really doesn't need much introduction, uh, very well known obviously in foreign policy circles. Um, he's been one of the leading voices on American uh, diplomacy uh, and America's place in the world. Uh, he served for 27 years on the front lines of uh, American foreign policy, uh, it, starting out his career in Cairo, in Jerusalem, uh, a big Middle East hand, a, a big South Asia hand, one of my favorites, um, and uh, has a lot to say, I think, about this subject. Uh, we will not hold against him his confession on his Twitter feed that he is a Red Sox Nation fan. It's okay. Oh, so am uh, I. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> uh, well, we're all out of luck, I guess, this year, um, including the Cubs and the Nationals. Um, so, um, but nonetheless, uh, baseball aside, I think we're going to have a good discussion here. Uh, a big driver for this conversation, as Mike pointed out, was sort of where we are now uh, with you know U.S. the U.S. role in the world, and a lot has changed, uh, not just in the last four years, 
uh, as you point out, Anne Marie, in your piece, a lot has changed um, over the last, you know, 200 years for American diplomacy. But I wonder what it was um, that precipitated uh, or triggered for you, and maybe we can hear from the others as well. Um, was there something specific, a set of circumstances, an event that made you start thinking about uh, the need to make some changes at the State Department now, as opposed to, you know, 10 years ago? Well, thanks, Candace. I will have to start uh, my answer by saying, actually, it was 10 years ago that I started thinking about these issues in the context of the first quadrennial diplomacy and development review that I conducted under uh, Secretary uh, Clinton when she was Secretary of State uh, in the Obama administration. And we had the mandate uh, to write a big strategy review. And one of the things that she very much wanted uh, and that Deputy Secretary Jacob Liu also wanted and had been tried before was to make it much easier for um, mid-career entry into the Foreign Service. Uh, and she indeed said, you know, we really ought to be able to tap more of America's talent, our talent in business, in NGOs, in the academy, faith communities, the scientific community. The, these are folks we should be able to bring in to be our diplomats at mid-career, uh, later than you would normally start in the Foreign Service. That proved impossible. We tried, uh, we got a lot of pushback from the Foreign Service Union, uh, and it, ultimately all we were able to do was make it somewhat easier for some civil servants who had worked uh, on specific foreign policy issues for seven years or more to become uh, foreign servants. So that's, that was really the genesis of my thinking. Uh, but more broadly, in this century, we need to put our very best foot forward as we long have. We've had very, very distinguished diplomats and, and Nick is, is one and I know many others. Uh, but in this century, if you look at how America engages the world, again, our business leaders, our NGOs, many of whom are side by side with diplomats. Uh, if you think of people from CARE or Oxfam uh, or Mercy Corps, all these big NGOs around the world. And then again, our academics um, and many of the children of our immigrants, right? Who already speak languages uh, and who go back and forth to their, their parents' uh, country. They are native, they are Americans, American born. Uh, we, there, there ought to be a way to harness much more of that talent. So I thought, well, uh, it's time to really overhaul the Foreign Service. This Foreign Service was really created in 1925 with the merger of the Diplomatic Service and the Consular Service. Uh, so I thought I would call for a really radical set of changes where we have a new global service uh, that really has five-year renewable terms and people could enter at any stage in their careers. That's a big, tall order. Congressman uh, Khanna, what, what are your thoughts on the subject? Well, thank you, first of all, for inviting me to participate. And uh, I have so much ad admiration for Anne-Marie Slaughter and uh, agree with her call. Uh, let me give you a concrete example of why this makes sense. Uh, I would argue that more than any uh, American diplomat uh, on coronavirus, when you look at the balance between security and privacy, uh, Tim Cook and Sundar Pichai have far greater say around the world uh, than any of our diplomats. I mean, they're the ones who are designing the apps in terms of uh, what the balance is uh, on privacy and what the balance is in terms of uh, uh, in terms of what the government can collect. Now, many people may not understand if they haven't been in the technology uh, world, uh, why it is that governments can't design an app that would uh, work on the iPhone uh, without draining the iPhone's battery and why you have to have uh, certain uh, apps be interoperable. And they probably don't uh, appreciate that uh, it doesn't really matter what they think if Google and, a and Apple have most of the phones and are making the architecture in a way that is basically uh, dictating what the privacy standard should be. So I give that example to say if we don't welcome people, for example, with technology background into the foreign service or this expanded global service, then we are hamstringing not just American interests, we're hamstringing the ability to understand the complexity of what's gonna dictate uh, foreign policy or world affairs. 
Uh, and so I would just focus on that one example as an argument for why we have to expand our conception uh, of the State Department and what foreign service may mean. And that's a great example. I mean, as, as Anne-Marie pointed out, uh, in some ways, uh, both Tim Cook and Sundar Pichai uh, really represent kind of the best of America. I mean, they're, they're um, you know, first generation, in, in one case, uh, college graduate, and the other, uh, you know, first generation immigrant. Uh, and, and this brings us to the question, I think Ambassador uh, Burns probably has something to say about this, you know, of kind of having worked in the State Department, um, you know it, 27 years, um, there's a real challenge, not just with kind of the roles, but kind of diversity, right? Um, and trying to get um, America's face represented uh, in all of its multitudes and all of its diversity uh, on the front lines of diplomacy. Well, thank you, Professor Rondar, very much. And thanks to my friend, Anne Marie, and thanks to Congressman Han. I'm pleased to be with you. I agree that the State Department needs to be reformed and specifically the Foreign Service does. There have been just three efforts in the last uh, 100 years where Congress has thought about authorizing the mission and mandate of the State Department, 1924, as, as um, Anne Marie said, 1946, so after the two big world wars, and 40 years ago, back in a very distant time, the beginning of my own career as an intern, that's a long time not to think strategically about the State Department. So I begin there. I hope Congress in 2021 will undertake uh, conversations and then hopefully passing a bill to authorize the Foreign Service and create a 21st century Foreign Service because right now there's a crisis in the Foreign Service, a crisis of morale, We've lost officers at the senior, med, mid, and junior levels, particularly in the Trump administration. People have been driven out. They've been discouraged from attending. You saw when the Foreign Service officers were subpoenaed to testify in the impeachment inquiry last autumn. They were vilified by President Trump and by Secretary Pompeo and the State Department leadership. I've never seen a crisis like this in 40 years, in my 40 years of being in the State Department uh, or out uh, as I have been for a while. And so we need reform. What should that reform look like? We need to think about the mission of the State Department and that's to be, is, is to represent the United States and the American people overseas and over 285 consulates and embassies. We need to think about the mandate that gets to, shouldn't the State Department and Foreign Service be the lead in dealing with all countries around the world? We need a new Foreign Service Act. We certainly need a much more diverse Foreign Service we were talking before we began, Professor, about the fact that we've gone backwards on African-American, Latinx, and, and Asian-American representation in the State Department. There are only four African-American ambassadors in the world today. That's a dramatic cut in, in what the Obama and George W. Bush and Bill Clinton administrations had achieved. And so we need overall reform. I would say this, we also need to depoliticize the State Department. The United States Civil and Foreign Service is nonpartisan. That's the service that I was in for 27 years. You need to have people who are not Democrats and Republicans who serve the country at state, just like we do in the military and the intelligence community. I'll just give you two data points. Right now, of our assistant secretaries of state, and that's the ambassadorial level line managers of the State Department, there are 26 of them, not a single one is a confirmed, Senate confirmed foreign service officer. That's the first time in a hundred years that we've had no foreign service officer Senate confirmed leading the State Department. And the second uh, data point I'll give you is that every administration since the Eisenhower administration has averaged roughly 70% of our ambassadors overseas were career ambassadors, foreign service officers, and about 30 political. President Trump is down barely at 60% uh, foreign service officers, it's the lowest level. And so we do need to think about the career as an entire career. People need to be trained for technology, yes. We need a mid-level program, and I agree with this, and I agree with Anne-Marie on this, to bring people into the State Department with those specialized skills. I wouldn't agree, however, with five-year terms. We have thousands of young people taking the foreign service exam from all of our graduate schools and universities, including Arizona State, Princeton, and Harvard, where the three of us are affiliated, most of them want to serve a full career. They are willing to do it if we give them the support to do it. And they need to be trained not just in technology, but languages. 
China specialists, Africanists, Latin America experts, you can't train someone in four or five years to be the kind of ambassadorial export, expert we're going to need at later stages. So I would agree on the main point, bring people in from the outside to join. But I, I think you have to keep this full career nonpartisan perspective. That's the bedrock of the federal government. So a lot to unpack there. I, I, I want to come back to this issue of kind of, you know, five years versus career, um, whether or not there is some sort of middle road, um, maybe between the two. Um, as somebody who, you know, is probably the last uh, of, of the Generation X folks to actually study Sovietology and, and Russian uh, when people cared about those things. And of course, we were kind of off the map for a long time. Uh, you know, I, I certainly would argue for myself um, some early pipeline investment. Um, I think, you know, high school is never too soon uh, because you really need to, to be, um, you know, fluent in culture, you have to be fluent in the language. And sometimes that can be difficult to do uh, if you're, you know, in your 20s or 30s and you're distracted by other things in life. Anyway, um, you know, I want to come back to that, but I also want to ask the question because I think you've hit on something, all three of you have hit on something here, um, which is around this kind of challenge of harmonization between um, defense, diplomacy, right, and development. And we saw that uh, most poignantly in Afghanistan where I spent five years uh, living on the ground, watching basically U.S. policy unfold. Um, and I, I think there were a lot of challenges there. Um, and I think Iraq was another example where um, this kind of attempt to integrate, uh, you know, uh, provincial reconstruction teams with, you know, the State Department and the military and USAID all in one place um, proved very challenging. And yet uh, we know that, you know, that is kind of the, the status quo ante uh, for any conflict where uh, you've got a lot of things going on with the counterinsurgency. So I, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about why it's been so difficult um, to harmonize uh, you know, the three Ds. We talk about it all the time. It's kind of like your, your IR 101 is you know, the need to have whole of government res responses. But is there something um, that has been particularly challenging? Is it organizational? Is it political? What are the roadblocks, Anne-Marie? <laughs> the biggest roadblock is simply uh, the disparity in funding, right? The Pentagon budget is just many multiples of the State Department's budget. Uh, and similarly with, with foreign assistance, even though uh, it may look big, it, it's still a very small uh, multiple of, of, the, of the Pentagon's budget. So the, the, the money is, is enormous. And I remember in the State Department where we were we were really trying to work very closely with the Pentagon, uh, but as uh, diplomats I would work with would say that, that the, you would go to a meeting with the Pentagon and your counterpart would show up with, you know, an entourage of some 20 people who had all done research and were all ready to go versus one or two people in the State Department. So we were often uh, quite swamped. Uh, and then sometimes uh, you would uh, often you would have tensions between state and USAID uh, that also meant uh, even there we weren't able to to really sh uh, show up as two equal pillars uh, to defense. But I, I do think this is connected to the need for reforms in the foreign service. It's not it's not the whole thing, but we really if we're serious about diplomacy and development, then we just have to put our money uh, where our commitments are, and that means really shifting funds uh, from from the, the Defense Department or finding new ways of funding the State Department and USAID. But here's the thing: if you look at our ability to tackle global problems. Let's think right now about global health or certainly climate change or access uh, you know, to energy, food, water, uh, counterterrorism, lots of big global problems. A lot of where the United States has resources are again, the private sector, many, many corporations around the world recognizing they can't work if, if, if the uh, circumstances uh, aren't conducive to local health and the health of their own employees. Uh, but again, lots and lots of NGOs, lots of universities. Uh, so we have a tremendous amount of influence and resources in sectors other than government. 
but it was my observation that even very talented foreign servant op foreign service officers precisely because they'd spent their whole career in the foreign service weren't really trained or 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 sort of provided with the culture of different sectors and the contacts in different sectors to bring together the kinds of coalitions I'd like to see. I mean, if you're talking about right now a vaccine uh, for COVID, you'd want to be talking to pharmaceutical companies, to healthcare NGOs, uh, certainly to international organizations where we, we are quite uh, skilled, uh, but also to scientists and doctors. Uh, and so I'm imagining a way of strengthening us on the diplomatic and particularly the development side that would again assume we had people representing us who had tons of former business associates as their colleagues or former uh, civic uh, folks in the civic sector or in the university sector. Uh, and that's something that a 30 year career in the foreign service makes it not impossible, but harder to do. Hmm. Really interesting points. And in fact, you, you mentioned actually, I think in your piece, um, you know, the kind of challenge with USAID and where it sits in the cabinet, right? Uh, and, I, and that kind of makes me wonder, uh, Congressman Hanna, um, you're the man with kind of your, your finger on the pulse of how money gets spent and allocated. Um, <laughs> do, you, do you see in this kind of new future of potential American restraint, as you've uh, pointed out, I think in your LA Times piece uh, a little while ago, um, you know, does American restraint then mean we have a rebalancing of the defense budget versus the diplomacy budget? And what does that look like in your, in your view? Well, what I've advocated is for uh, military re restraint unless uh, a, a direct threat to the United States, but that would mean more active engagement on the diplomatic front, uh, more active engagement uh, in terms of empowering uh, other nations where we can be strategic with our aid. Uh, so I think that uh, restraint in the military should not be confused with uh, isolationism. I think America has a, uh, a strong uh, obligation to, uh, to lead, uh, to build alliances, to help uh, make sure that uh, we're promoting uh, our values, which uh, I, I still believe on uh, freedom of expression, on freedom of assembly, on freedom of press. Uh, are values that have uh, universal worth. I think the challenge in uh, candidly is that uh, when you see so many parts of the American politics and American body uh, politic uh, feeling that they have not had a fair shake, feeling that uh, globalization and deindustrialization have left them behind, uh, that they don't feel uh, a uh, access to the, the, the American dream, that their kids are having to leave the communities they grew up in, then it becomes hard to uh, marshal a consensus uh, for outward looking action. And so in my view, the problem of solving global problems is in, inextricably linked to the breakdown of our, uh, democratic, uh, 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 our democratic ability to solve domestic problems and how we figure out a place-based economic strategy in getting people uh, more of a stake in today's contemporary economy, I think is linked to developing a greater consensus uh, for the type of increases in USAID or foreign engagement that, that we need. Absolutely valid. I mean, you know, this question of why spend money on schools in Afghanistan or in Bangladesh when we need, you know, schools here at home, I mean, this is a big debate. Ambassador Burns, I think you also um, probably have some uh, perspective on this, especially I, I'm curious if, you know, uh, if you can pull from your experience um, really specifics on where uh, this kind of uh, inability to navigate, not have the resources, right, um, for diplomacy has really been a stumbling block for you or that you've seen uh, in your personal experience. Well, I agree very strongly with Congressman Hanna, what he just said. We need to think of our diplomats as our front on point representatives of the American people. And we ought to be exhausting diplomacy before we even think about the use of force. Since 9-11, uh, we've been in two very expensive, very bloody, very costly land wars. 19 years in Afghanistan, we're still in Iraq so many years later. And we've got to learn the lessons that um, we've got to think about 
uh, other solutions to these global problems. And as Anne Marie has said, think about the agenda for the next couple of years is to recover from the pandemic, is to recover from the great re from this terrible recession that we're in, is to do something about climate change and go back into the Paris Climate Change Accord, work on the whole range of transnational problems. Those are not, they don't lend themselves to military power. We need the military. We need the intelligence community. We need the State Department out front, foreign and civil service, and the State Department's too weak. Another data point, we've been spending for the last 10 to 15 years, about $700 billion a year on our defense. We spend about $54 billion a year on the State Department, on USAID, and all US foreign assistance. I mean, just think about the dichotomy there. I'm not arguing that the State Department deserves and USAID 700 billion, but it, it does give you a sense of our priorities. And the last thing I'll say is that we at Harvard have been working on a report for over two years now. Four of us former foreign service officers, Marcy Reese, Nancy McEldowney, Mark Grossman and myself, is to think through, how do we put diplomacy first? How do the American people lead with that first? Why would that be? We think it's in our interest. Why would it be in our interest? And what kind of reforms do you need to make? I would use the word, we need to reimagine the State Department. I agree with what I really like about Anne Marie's piece and Anne Marie in general is such a creative thinker is this is a time to reimagine, revive and rebuild. We can't just use the playbook of the last couple of decades and we do need radical change. We ought to have a reserve corps in the State Department that Congress would authorize and fund so that when we have a Haiti earthquake or a major global pandemic, we've got people trained from our society who can come out of their jobs and contribute to the government. We need this mid-level core to bring in specialized people on specialized topics and technology is one of them. But we also need to reinvest in our core foreign service officers and we haven't done that and we've let them down. So I think it's a big moment. That's why I'm happy to be here today uh, in this discussion. Well, that provides a perfect segue for maybe what will be my last question before we open it up for Q&A. And I, I wanna encourage folks, uh, if you haven't put a question in the Q&A column, please do. We have some folks tracking that uh, and I will have to put on my um, older woman glasses to look at that. But in any case, uh, um, the, the, the segue here that you, you've kind of provided Ambassador Burns is um, the question of like, how do we get this done? Basically, you know, we're talking about doing something, reimagining, reinventing, um, remapping, redesigning, essentially American diplomacy for the 21st century. Um, I think we could argue uh, we are in a situation where we have a multipolar world um, where, you know, U.S. hegemony is not a given uh, and, and certainly maybe even uh, up for debate domestically in terms of how we view ourselves in the world. Um, so, and, and, you know, we had a kind of, as you point out, 40 years ago, uh, around the time when there was major reform in the State Department, uh, there was a triggering event uh, for that. And, and that was, of course, uh, the disastrous uh, attempt, unfortunately, to uh, extract uh, uh, hostages from Iran. Uh, a big moment, uh, Eagle One, the big operation that unfortunately also led to uh, you know, a lot of casualties and a lot of embarrassment, but then of course uh, resulted in the complete uh, overhaul of the combatant commands, right? And, and under uh, Goldwater Nichols, which is kind of the gold standard for how uh, change happens in American uh, interagency bureaucracy, uh, th there's a perfect example. To do that, of course, you need the conversation to get to get there publicly, right? It can't just be happening between uh, folks on a Zoom screen. Um, what are the steps? I mean, what, you know, I'd actually go to Congressman uh, Hanna a little bit to talk a little bit about the role of Congress, but also uh, to you then, uh, Anne-Marie and, and Ambassador Burns, uh, to talk a little bit about the role of public and also public institutions in, in shaping that conversation. So Congressman Hanna, um, what are the steps to kind of get this moving, get this reform going? Well, candidly, reform is very difficult. I mean, I remember when President Obama wanted to restructure uh, the Department of Commerce uh, and in a way that I thought was perfectly uh, reasonable. And uh, he had Jeffrey Zients and others look into combining duplicative agencies and having something that would promote American competitiveness. Uh, and uh, I remember a discussion of, about why certain offices were in certain states uh, and we were talking about the rate, I was making a presentation of the rate of return and what the efficiency is and what the uh, value to the GDP is. And someone said, you know, 
kind of naively that's there because so-and-so senator wants it in that uh, that state. So uh, the domestic politics uh, in turf and jurisdiction uh, are uh, very real phenomena. So what then can motivate uh, reform? Usually in my experience, it has it's born out of some form of crisis uh, and unmet need. So we saw, of course, after 9-11, uh, the commission recommending massive reform necessary to strengthen our internal security because there were breaches that everyone realized. And I wonder whether this pandemic, whatever one's partisan view, I think it's obvious that America can prepare better for a future pandemic. I wonder whether that may give some impetus uh, for, uh, for reform. But I think it'll be important to link whatever reform effort we're undertaking to something people feel very immediately as uh, necessary in improving their lives to, to get Congress to act. Yeah, triggers. So uh, first of all, I just have to com uh, compliment Nick, who is a brilliant diplomat. And if you'll note, even though he and I disagree on a number of things, like the diplomat he is, he's figured out the things we agree on, which is exactly the practice of diplomacy. And, and Nick, I will also say I very strongly support your idea of a reserve. My father was in the Navy Reserve. You know, Every two weeks, he would go. And th that idea is a very important one and shouldn't be limited uh, to our, to our milita military. Uh, to the idea of how we get this done, I do I do hope that the pandemic uh, is is part of a trigger. Although, of course, uh, you, you know, if you think about 9/11, that was a very a huge and but very short uh, shock. I mean, the actual event, which was easier. That by we have so many different things we need to fix. Uh, that it's hard to to imagine that you're going to have a, a, the equivalent of a 9-11 commission on overhauling the State Department. On the other hand, I think there is there's a dramatic need for the U.S. government across the board to be taking advantage of what we can now do because of technology. The U.S. government's been well behind and the actual technology that the State Department uses is, is deplorable. It's really 10 to 20 years behind uh, the standard. But so I can imagine a Goldwater Nichols kind of commission which would have to be prepared by work in think tanks and academic centers as the Goldwater uh, Nichols process was. The, the uh, Center for Strategic and International Studies uh, did a lot of work together with members of Congress before there were congressional hearings. But I could imagine a proposal for essentially modernizing the government to both take account of the very different world we find ourselves in post-Cold War, which we really haven't done, and to take advantage of what we can now do because of technology. I mean, honestly, as much as I love cables, you know, in an era of email and an era of even more instant communication than email, there, there's a tremendous amount that could be done. So that's that's how I would probably frame it, not just re, re, reforming the State Department, reinventing the State Department, but part of a larger overhaul in government initiative. And I wouldn't tell a new administration to do that right away. I'd tell them to lay the groundwork and do it with Congress, because Congress is essential here for all the political reasons uh, that Congressman Khanna mentioned. So a conversation, Ambassador, between uh, the public in many different forms and Congress back and forth, right? I think so. And, and hopefully this can be nonpartisan. I know that may be naive to say we can be nonpartisan, but we need both parties involved. You have to engage the public. In our Harvard re, um, research, I think we've met with now with four or 500 members of the public, largely in World Affairs Councils. I'll be with the Cleveland World Affairs Council next week to talk about this. There are a lot of good ideas that come out of the American people, uh, local service organizations, NGOs, and businesses across the country. We ought to be listening to them. Second, as Anne-Marie suggests, a new administration, and I hope it's going to be a Joe Biden administration, by the way, uh, has got to take this on, of a radical overhaul of the personnel system and the structure, the way all three of us have been talking. And I agree with Anne-Marie, not just because I'm trying to be a diplomat, by the way, but I do agree with her that you can't just produce this in a month or two at the beginning of an administration. This has to be carefully thought through. So the administration needs to commit to it. And third, and I would say, Congressman, most importantly, Congress needs to write the laws. Mm -hmm. You know, to, to go 40 years without a Foreign Service Act, 
to actually say, what should the mission be? What is the mandate? Are these, how does this organization succeed? We need Congress, both parties uh, to weigh in here. This may take one to two to three years, but it'll be worth it. Final point I'd say is we did this with the military after the failure in Vietnam. The Colin Powell generation led it, Goldwater Nichols. We did it with the intelligence community after the intelligence failure at 9-11 and on the Iraq war. We've not done this with the State Department and we've gone out and talked to the architects of the military reform and the intelligence community reform. And they tell us, you have to be all in. You have to admit the mistakes and problems that you have. And so part of this, frankly, is the Foreign Service not as, as victim here, but how do we change the culture of the Foreign Service to make it much more risk uh, tolerant and much more proactive. And I think that's gonna be a, a tall order as well, but we badly need this. Right, I mean, some lessons learned. I mean, a lot of um, past efforts, you know, come directly from really examining um, some very case specific instances in which uh, there have been these challenges and picking them apart, um, looking at the anatomy of different challenges and risks and mistakes uh, as they occurred, right, in situ. So I think that's a, a, an excellent point. And Ambassador, um, I'm gonna open it up now uh, for Q&A here. And obviously, um, I guess <laughs> your Red Sox uh, Nations fan <laughs> out there wanna hear from you a little bit more um, <laughs> uh, about the- We finished the, the last place this year, so we need to encourage each other. <laughs> <laughs> It's a hard world. It's a hard world for baseball fans this year, I have to say. I watched Moneyball last night um, and had a, a moment of nostalgia. Um, <laughs> but in any case, um, our, our questioner asks uh, a very important question, which is actually kind of baseball relevant. How do you rebuild a team that has been broken down, right? Um, we've seen, as you pointed out, as others have pointed out here, uh, over the last three and a half, four years, um, an absolute decimation of the Foreign Service. Uh, morale is low, um, you know, respect for uh, the service itself <laughs> is dwindling. And I think the, the point that you kind of put your finger on is a lot of people of color have left. There are four ambassadors of color, uh, African-Americans. Uh, you know, for me, a mixed race American woman, that's shocking. Um, so how do you rebuild the trust in communities of color where we need to be recruiting? Um, and how do you incentivize um, folks to come back into the service? I'll, I'll put that to you, Ambassador, and then maybe Anne-Marie and, and the Congressman. Sure, and I'll try to be brief so my two colleagues can come right in. Um, we need presidential leadership. We need someone who comes along and says, I believe in you. I believe in, the public, in public service. I believe in the career professionals, and we don't have that with Trump. You remember when he said that the State Department was the deep state? with the Secretary of State standing beside him on the White House press room, and Pompeo did not have the courage to speak up on behalf of the men and women of the Foreign Service. That was the lowest point for me, thinking about what has happened. Joe Biden is a leader who deeply believes in government and strengthening government and in public service, so we need that. But Candace, you're right. In the, with the hundreds of people with whom we've spoken, diversity probably has been the dominant issue, the lack of diversity the lack of opportunities for um, people of color to come into the State Department and to succeed. The interesting thing is, and Anne-Marie and I both teach, and we will, the three of us teach, you do too, we're seeing a lot of uh, people of color, students, who want careers in the Foreign Service and in the CIA and the military. And we're actually recruiting through the Pickering and Wrangle and Payne scholarships, a lot of good young people, African-Americans, Latino and Latino, Latino and Latina officers, we're not retaining them because we're imposing uh, barricades to them, to their uh, career advancement once they get in. Uh, sometimes um, there's not an acceptance. I think the kind of acceptance to diversity promotion and inclusion that has to take place. One of the solutions that we've thought about, and we've been led to this by people of color, every single person in the State Department, when they're evaluated annually on their individual employment report, it can't just be, I'm sensitive to, e to equal opportunity. What have you done? What have you done to mentor people and bring them along? And that has to start with the leader, with the president, with the secretary of state, and everybody has to infuse, be infused by it. It's not happening right now. So, so I, I agree with that, but I think this does go to the heart maybe of, of uh, my disagreement about how radical the reform needs to be, because I think it's true 
uh, that there, there are plenty of people taking the Foreign Service uh, exam, although, again, we all agree that the department now is demoralized and fewer people are enthusiastic about joining. But when I was in the State Department, and just more generally, uh, after decades working with younger people as a professor and, and even now, many of the young people, I would say all of them that I talked to, do not think of anything in terms of a 30 year career. They are, they, in fact, we, their mentors are telling them that they're gonna have multiple, not just jobs, but careers that they should be planning for, uh, constantly learning, constantly growing. Uh, when I was Dean of the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs, I would encourage all of my uh, students to think about working in all three sectors, in the civic sector, the public sector, and the private sector. And so I really do think if we want a whole new generation of Americans to join the Foreign Service, we have to make it much easier for them to do so. We have to make it easier for them to get their qualifications in another sector. And there are plenty of people in business who spend a lot of time abroad and are totally fluent in languages. We haven't done so well even with our Foreign Service officers in terms of the kind of fluency in languages that let our diplomats, uh, for instance, go on foreign television and interview. Uh, so th that is exactly when I talk about a five-year renewable tour of duty, and maybe it's a seven-year renewable tour of duty. Maybe there is a sort of a, a minimum length of time you must commit. I certainly recognize the value of that. But I think if we're going to rebuild, we have to, to infuse, we don't have to, we don't, we have to do more than just raising the morale and having presidential leadership, both of which I agree with. But we have to really say to a generation of Americans, hey, this is a very exciting thing that you can do in your life, but it's not your whole career. That's right. I mean, um, I'll just chime in and, and I want to hear from the Congress as well. Uh, I have to admit to being a former Princeton student and, uh, who benefited from a mid-career uh, sort of transitional program. Uh, and I think there's there is something to that um, that you know there are a number of barriers for people of color right now: uh, cost of college, cost of uh, a graduate education. We cannot forget that those barriers are still there. Uh, if you want to undertake uh, you know a, a career in international relations, international affairs, you have to be prepared to either um, you know go into pretty massive debt today. Um, you know, or you've got to be a pretty stellar, outstanding student in one of the hard languages, Arabic, Japanese, Chinese, Russian, uh, and, and those programs are long gone. Um, so I think that that's a very important point um, about the, some of the other barriers outside of uh, sort of the standard track for foreign service. Congressman, what do you think about this issue? Well, I, I think both uh, Ambassador Burns and uh, Henry have uh, thoughtful points. Maybe we can uh, have a hybrid approach, have some folks there <laughs> for life and have some folks there uh, for shorter terms. Uh, that's usually how Congress does things, try to figure out the compromise, but or maybe we could compromise more. But I think that the amb ambassador's point uh, about the attack on service is a, uh, a very uh, profound one. I mean, one of the things that I think we forget is how radical Donald Trump's presidency was, someone who's never served on a commission on city council, coming in as a business person and saying uh, public service doesn't work. They, uh, the, the, the folks who have been elected, the folks who have been serving in the bureaucracy, uh, they have failed you and that uh, we need a totally different approach and an attack really on this idea of uh, public service, uh, which was very different than uh, most of the previous presidents. And the question is, how do we restore people's confidence, uh, their trust in public service, uh, knowing that public service is inc incredibly hard because we are uh, facing economic forces and globalization that is really uh, putting challenges on many parts of the country. We're transitioning to a multiracial, multicultural democracy and struggling to define a common American uh, identity. So I, I guess the, I, I think inspired presidential leadership uh, would help, but I think we have a generational challenge of how we redefine uh, a public service in a way that will inspire people uh, in how we have a common purpose, a common American story uh, after the extraordinary polarization. I, I don't have an answer to that other than to say that it's a, a daunting challenge. I think hopefully Joe Biden 
will help us, but I think beyond even one president. Well, you created a great segue. Actually, we have a question here from Brett. Um, uh, is there still bipartisan consensus that the State Department matters? I think, Congressman, um, you, you alluded to presidential leadership, but I just wonder if you find partners across the aisle um, you know, that you can talk to about this, where there is at least some momentum uh, that you can build on perhaps in, in the next administration. Yes, no, there, there is. I mean, Secretary Mattis, when he used to testify in front of the Armed Services Committee, used to be always uh, an advocate for increased uh, uh, State Department funding. There are people in Congress who uh, recognize the, the critical role of alliances and the critical role of diplomacy. I had gone uh, with Speaker Pelosi to uh, Munich for the Munich Security Conference, where we had a bipartisan uh, group of, uh, of, of legislators. So, uh, I think that there can be a, a bipartisan consensus on the need to rebuild it. But obviously you need some public support. And I think this is another question we have from Steve Clemens here. Um, and I think we touched on this a little bit. You know, Americans are tired. Uh, we're, we're, we're exhausted by, you know, these forever wars. It's 20 years uh, in the Middle East. Um, there's a lot of doubt. We've seen Pew um, polls about sort of uh, Americans' sense of um, disconnect with those wars in particular, and uh, maybe not understanding what the trade-offs are when we don't have diplomacy, right? Uh, when we don't have the right kind of package for development and the harmonization. So how do you convince doubtful Amer Americans um, that global engagement really does matter, uh, that it enh enhances their lives as opposed to um, undercutting their lives or undermining their future, uh, why invest in, in sort of this diplomacy stuff at all? Who wants to take that, Anne-Marie? Uh, well, I was going to let Nick start because you've been out on the hustings actually uh, doing just that and I'm, I'll have, I've got a few thoughts as well. Go ahead, Anne-Marie, I'll follow. I'm, I'm happy to do that. So I actually think we need to start more with the America we are becoming. Uh, and indeed, uh, Congressman Hanna said, you know, we are, we're becoming a multiracial uh, democracy. It, indeed, by 2027, uh, there will be no white majority uh, among Americans, uh, uh, Americans under 30. So that's not very far away. Uh, and then, of course, by 2045 or so, that will be true of the whole country. If you look at what that means as a country, we are, will still be, 49% uh, white, those white people come from all over the place still, lots of immigrants uh, still, but certainly among Americans of color, uh, we are reflecting the world. Uh, to me, that is a source of great pride. So the place I would start is really celebrating, uh, not immigrants, these are the children of immigrants, sometimes two, two generations on, uh, but still very connected. Uh, to their parents uh, or grandparents' country. I'm half Belgian. I grew up going back and forth to Europe. But if I were a Latina, I might be going back and forth to Guatemala uh, or to Brazil, uh, to many other places. Uh, if I am African-American, I may have been here for 200 or 300 years, but I may also have parents who are Nigerian. And on it goes. Uh, so I would really start by reminding people across the country, look who we are. We reflect the world. It is thus imperative that we engage and I would say even connect the world. Uh, and I think there's a whole generation who don't support America, the global policeman, absolutely not, but do support the idea that America can be a force for good in the world and that we can lead in ways uh, that bring lots of other countries together and help solve global problems. Master Burns? Well, I say it's a question of just reminding people about their own self-interest and our communities and state self-interest. So many jobs in America now, one of every six jobs are tied to exports of goods or services. The whole security of the country was challenged by 21 young men on 9-11 who broke through all of our security uh, to get in and kill 3,000 Americans and take down the Twin Towers. We're vulnerable unless we work with the rest of the world on our security. And frankly, on, in 2020, 2021, you look at the pandemic, we've gotta be working around the world to help. That helps us and it helps people around the world. The recession, we're not gonna get out of the recession 
unless we're working globally as well. So it is a matter of self-interest as well as being the right thing to do. Uh, the Chicago Council polls are very interesting here. Mm -hmm. They show the American public is not isolationist. Historically high levels of support, 75% a year ago for NATO in that poll. You can't get Americans to agree the sky is blue, 75% of Americans, but they do agree that NATO is important. But the most recent poll that was just announced by our mutual friend, Evo Dalder, show that there is beginning to be a divergence, and maybe the Congressman knows a lot more about this, between Republicans and Democrats. Uh, Trump has had an impact on the Republican Party. They're less global. They're less supportive of American engagement. Democrats, more supportive. And so that worries me a bit because we do need both parties to be supporting an outward looking foreign policy. Excellent point. And actually, speaking specifically to, uh, we could point to US China trade balance uh, as something that is a pocketbook issue for any Midwesterner. I'm a former Chicagoan. Uh, I know when I get on a plane and I go home uh, to see relatives, the price of corn is talked about um, and, and China is pointed to. So, I mean, I think that's a very good point. Um, Congressman Hanna, what do you think about um, getting Americans to understand the connection between their pocketbooks at home, their reality at home, and how we look abroad? I think most Americans understand it. I think, unfortunately, Donald Trump has painted a dystopian picture, uh, thinking that uh, the tariff war is going to uh, bring back uh, these jobs, which the data shows hasn't happened. I mean, the data shows that the trade deficit is worse. The data shows it's actually hurt agricultural communities, hurt our ability uh, to export. It hasn't brought back uh, the manufacturing that has been promised, but he has managed to spin a narrative uh, that uh, a, uh, a trade war uh, is going to uh, help bring these communities back. And the challenge for uh, the Democratic Party is uh, how do we offer a alternative a, a vision for these communities? I mean, his, Donald Trump basically says you lost your jobs and you lost your jobs because the governing class was asleep for the last 20 years and China and Mexico took them, Mexican immigrants to China. It's totally false, but that's the story he's been telling uh, on Twitter, on cable news for the last four years. And the, the challenge for us is to say, no, we do have a vision for bringing jobs, bringing new jobs into these communities. We recognize these communities have been left out uh, and here is our vision and you can be part of this global world, global economy, where you aren't going to be a loser in it. Uh, and I, I, I think Joe Biden has a vision for that. I mean, he's, he's come out with policies on investing in new industry, investing in industry across uh, the country. Uh, but the, the, the proof will be, if we do get a chance to lead, uh, how we deliver on that to, to show people that there is a positive engagement with the world uh, that can benefit them, as opposed to uh, a reliance on uh, a nationalist rhetoric that really hasn't moved the needle. Yeah, well, obviously we're gonna need uh, conversations on both sides of the aisle going forward. We have one more question. I think we have just enough time to slip in here um, from Philip, Philip McDonough, uh, former Irish ambassador to India and Russia. Uh, some of you may have met him on the front lines here and there. Uh, two questions uh, the, the former ambassador puts to us. Uh, first, uh, uh, is the panel underestimating the convening power of embassies? Um, it's not just about the context of you know, foreign service officers, um, but, but also kind of the presence of embassies as a kind of, as a place where American ideals can be discussed, pursued, promoted. Um, I think we know uh, post uh, 2011, uh, there are some serious challenges with um, security uh, for embassies, getting people in, getting people out. Um, what's, what's your view on that? Maybe I'll take Ambassador Burns and then Anne-Marie. Well, it's a good question, Ambassador, and thank you for asking it. I, I think the, I was ambassador to Greece, the bilateral ambassador, and I was ambassador to NATO. And I think the lesson I had to learn is that, yes, the government function, the United States government re relating to the host government through the person of the embassy staff is really important. And in some countries, it's vitally important. Think of China or Russia. But in the spirit of this conversation, the, the fundamental lesson I learned as ambassador to Greece is that American business, American NGOs, American universities, um, in the case of Greece, fraternal Greek American organizations, they were the majority of the relationship. And so we felt our job in the embassy was to help them, enable them. So you have kind of a transparent embassy where Americans from different walks of life feel that we can help them 
negotiate their way forward, but we really wanted to have them succeed. And I think that's how a lot of our ambassadors in the modern world are thinking, especially in the United States, about the value of embassies. They're not antique. They're not from a vanished world. They're really important, but you've got to understand it's not just about the government's business. It's about the whole of society business. I would agree with that uh, view of, of what an embassy should be doing. And again, it's one of the reasons I think it should be easier for, for those, for business or for uh, people from other sectors to actually become the people in the embassy as, as the foreign service, or as I, I put it, a global service. But I, I would also second Candace's point about security. It, it really made my heart ache uh, when I was in government and since then to go to a capital uh, and see an American embassy that looks like Fort Knox. I'm thinking about the new embassy in Singapore, uh, but also in London, the places where diplomats themselves would tell me that they would meet their contacts outside the embassy so that the, the poor person they were meeting did not have to spend all the time necessary to go through the protocols to get them into the embassy. And really as an American and as someone who thinks of our country as open, as welcoming, uh, I think we've wildly overcorrected on the, the absolute need, of course, to keep people safe. But if we can't keep people safe without a bunker, then we need to rethink how we are, we are present because it's not the way I think America should be showing up in other countries. Congressman, I hate to put you on the spot. Obviously, this, um, this raises a question. We, we know what 2011 meant for uh, the security of diplomacy in the past. And I don't think that conversation has been resolved uh, neither in the public um, sphere nor in, in Congress. Um, you, what are the options in terms of um, changing the face of American diplomacy? So one, it becomes more approachable uh, and also changing kind of the footprint um, so that it becomes a little bit less threatening and, and uh, allowing for the kind of engagement that Ambassador Burns uh, and, and Anne Marie were just discussing. Well, I think the work that both Anne Marie and Ambassador Burns are doing, which is to link uh, American foreign policy to uh, grassroots conversations, is so important. I'll tell you personally, when I was uh, born in Philadelphia and uh, when I was a young person, I went to uh, India to visit my grandparents. And I still remember I was 10 or 12, 12 or 13 uh, at the time, and I was in line with one of my cousins who uh, was not a U.S. citizen, but I was a U.S. citizen. And I have this uh, vivid recollection of someone uh, at the American embassy yelling at me saying, you get out of that line, uh, you're not an American citizen. And I had to show them uh, my passport. Of course, when I went, uh, being in the Obama administration, I met the ambassador there. But the point is that, uh, as Nick said, the, the, the State Department, the embassies are our face to the world. This is uh, most, Ameri most people around the world never get to see an American, but they see their, their understanding of who we are, of what kind of people we are, is based on their interactions and what they hear uh, from those embassies. Uh, and when I was at Munich, you know, the whole Munich conference was called uh, the West versus the Rest. And I remember having a conversation I had asked uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, I said, uh, you know, I, I was born in Philadelphia in 1976, our bicentenary, and yet my grandfather spent uh, four years in uh, jail with Gandhi. So does that make me a product of the West or the rest? And Trudeau <laughs> talked about uh, how we have to look differently in multiracial, multiethnic democracies. And so the, the, in the, the, what will create more trust is to make sure that we value the expertise because Trump has had a systematic uh, assault on expertise and knowledge. And, and, and that's, that's wrong, you know? I mean, you just can't have any person uh, go work at the State Department and have the success that Ambassador Burns or Anne-Marie Slaughter has. I mean, that's just, it's, it's, you have to have respect for experience, expertise, but that experience and expertise has to be rooted in conversations that are organic to a community so that they're not out of touch. And I think that that's what will build trust. Conversations, it's all about the American conversation. Well, uh, I think we're at time here. I just wanna thank all of our panelists uh, and also our audience for some really thoughtful questions 
Uh, I think we're going to be continuing this conversation going forward. And uh, please look out for new announcements from New America and from our panelists about the work we're doing to talk about the reinvention of the State Department and, and diplomacy in America's place in the world. Thanks.